Mr. Hunter alluded to that. That bread is rich. Uh, whenever you drive around in this country and see the word Firestone, think about Liberia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Liberia is supposed to be maybe the second or third rubber producing country in the world. Mm -hmm. There was a contract signed with Liberian government in 1926 to have its rubber in the country for 99 years. But the same exploitation now, they go down there, and you can travel for hours in Liberia, you only see rubber trees. And rubber trees look just like those trees standing over there. They scrape it in the morning, take the little liquid from it, looks like milk, put it in the box and put whatever they put on it, it becomes rubber. It comes here, turn into rubber tires, and they sell me one tire. Now they pay me in Liberia maybe what, $2 a day or $3 a day, and, 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 and they'll pay me here $25 an hour to make one tire. Okay, be of good rich. You the royal. Those people get their raw material from Liberia. And out of 46, 47 thousand square miles, you got about 75% of our land that have not been touched by your land sitting there. I'm telling you for real. And we got these natural resources. That's what I'm say. It is there. But you somebody got to go in and be able to penetrate the thing. It is there. The opportunities are there. And like she rightfully said, if you look, I go back home to think I'm a big, big shot because I had an American I mean, education, right? I'm the same person. But just because I'm coming from the United States, right? Oh man, you know, I can get a lot of stuff done, a lot of stuff that I, you know, that I want. So the opportunities are there. But you have to be willing to go down there. You said entrepreneur, you know what that means. You may be willing to take the risk. You got to be willing to take the risk and put the money up front and get to work. Like I can, I can speak from my experience when it comes to utilizing the resources in Africa. Like my older brother, his name is Steven. What he does, he owns a nonprofit organization that's called Education for Liberia. So their goal is that they take kids through families doesn't have the money to send them to school. Because that's one thing people don't understand in Africa is in Africa. Like education is a necessity for every African person. There is no matter what part, especially Liberians. We are. A lot of them are uneducated in our country, and that's what the foreign world is using against us, our lack of education. When they come in, they show you the white teeth and the smile, you think everything is good, and then next thing you know, they're stealing from you, stealing the resources. They're investing money from the government, through politicians, and then everybody just sits there and acts naive. But with him, what he does is that he takes kids who have all less fortunate, he gives them scholarship, and he sends them to school, starts from elementary school, and then builds their way up. And then he's so far, he's brought about, about three or four kids here for college, and their tuition is paid out. They don't have to pay, the family doesn't pay a penny of it. Everything is free. They don't have to worry about it. The books, uh, laptops, everything that they need for school, he covers everything his organization does. And then that is funded by his shoes company that he has. So the funding for that goes back into it. So that's one thing he's doing as far as entrepreneur. You know, though he's not making, he's not direct profiting from it. This country is, so that's something that makes him better. And for me, although I haven't done anything directly in Africa, but I know my mother it does, her um, her tribe, she's Golat, and they have a, a, a organization in Charlotte, which where I, live, where I stay at. And they have meetings and they all pay dues, which those money are, goes back right back into their neighborhood, the community, to help the kids back there. But, yeah, there's a ton of opportunity for entrepreneurship. You just have to take the risk. And trust me, the education is that you can you graduate from with an associate degree and go back into Liberia or anywhere in Africa. Trust me, you live a really good life. You enjoy. You enjoy the experience. I want to give one more example before we get to um, your question. Um, one of the guys that is on the Forbes list for one of the richest men in the world. He's in Africa. I forget what country he's from. So, um, but he saw a small need. The country that he lives in, they didn't have streets. Hmm? It might be. I don't. I'm not sure though. But they didn't have streets. So he literally started off with a cement country. Like I don't think you guys understand. Like they don't have basic necessities. So you could go into Africa with a basic level skill level business. It doesn't even have to be something you went to college for and literally capitalize off of that because these people aren't able to organize 
and put together the systems that we have here in America. He started off with a cement company, it grew to a rice company, just supplying these basic needs, and now this guy is the richest man in the world. And it, it doesn't take a middle schooler to see that someone needs cement. It doesn't take, you know, a rocket science to see the need for things in Africa. These are simple things that each and every one of us can do and provide and put a business together for these literal simple needs. Like everybody wants to compete in America, but the gold is in Africa. Like that's that's where the resources are. So I would just preach to anybody, you know, that really, really wants to make it. The opportunity is so easy to make it in Africa. Y'all can stay here competing in America and not get anywhere, but you can go over there literally with a simple idea, great organization, great management, and make it happen easily. And people will work for you and follow you because they want to be a part of something that's organized, a part of something from people with American education. Like People will want to congregate together to be a part of something that you put together simply because you had an American education. Like People don't take advantage of that, and you don't see it because you're born in America, so this is the norm to us. But you go over there, and they're like, wow, like, oh my gosh, like they're raving over it. So I just really, really, really encourage anybody to take advantage of the opportunities that are there in Africa and really, really make it happen. Um, but I saw you had a question. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, again, thank you for this panel, y'all. Um, so on a psychological note for black people in America, because um, now the slaves, um, slavery is mentally, it's not metal no more. How, because the nation cannot rise above its women, so I'm like a women's aspect, because I've seen that I'm the only woman mm -hmm. in the audience. So I was like, oh, let me think of a woman question. How, what's some advice you can give to the ladies that are watching this to gain some self-respect and some worth? And then I have two questions too, so that's the woman question, keep that in mind. And the other one is, right now, in my opinion, what I'm seeing, especially on social media, that a lot of black people are focused on trying to get equity and equal rights in America versus using their tools of, of American education and going back to Africa. So how can we like switch that and not be so focused on trying to be equal in America because this is a white man's country, but we built it. However, but go back to Africa and start building up Africa. Like Marcus um, Garvey had this beautiful idea, which still is here. We just have to revolution that idea and really do that. Well, one, one of the things that I noticed since I've been here is the matter of trust in this country. And I think we have been, we have been um, brainwashed not to trust our brothers and our sisters. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's my and yours. And there's no place where we can get together. Typical example, you live in a neighborhood in this country. You better know your next little neighbor. Yeah. Compared to in our setting, everybody that will become connected. But one of the things you are, in order for an, an American to get some members, some brothers and sisters together, to put the natural, to put the resources together, to go and penetrate the public of Africa, not just Liberia and Moon, and go down there and do some stuff, it, you've got to have that trust. Once you don't have that, it's difficult to succeed. Everybody wants to know. And, 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 and that's what it boils down to, that trust. I don't trust you. I don't know you, you know. And, uh, you know, it creates a problem. So in America, I've, I've lived here for a while, and that is hurting us here. I don't trust you. I don't know you. And so how will you do that? when they have been already programmed in the people's mind, and did, you know, way back in the days, it's yours, don't let nobody take it from you, and you know, and all they fought too hard for it, they worked too hard for it, and that resonated in my head. Then I can't get out of that, out of that, you know, where I am, I can't get out. I can't go on now and start trusting other people, so we can put our good research together to get this thing going. I hope that makes sense. I agree. I agree. Um, I think um, to just get the whole thing going, it starts really simple. 
Um, even though it seems like something really grand, it starts with conversations. It starts with taking initiatives like this, and shout out to Daryl for really like organizing this and doing all the legwork and putting this together. But it starts with conversations. Network. Figure out who your resources are with people in Africa. Everybody knows, a, and even though this is about Liberia, but everybody knows a Nigerian, a Congolese. Everybody knows somebody that's African, and if you don't, there may be like just a couple doors away. Like we have access to those people. So it starts as simple as having conversations. Um, I think one of the reasons, um, in addition to what he said, trust, a lot of people are scared. Um, they see what happened to Marcus Garvey and they see what happened to these uh, people that are really trying to do um, create these movements of moving people from America to Africa um, for better opportunities. Um, and they see what happened to these people. And I mean, I guess at the end of the day, it just all comes down to your heart, um, what you're passionate about, what you believe in, um, and really what you're willing to do to make it happen. I mean, Marcus Garvey was willing to die for it, and that's what it comes down to. Like, and not saying that's what's gonna have to happen. Like, you don't have to, you know, die for it, but you have to really be willing to be that serious about going over there, making it happen, and understanding it's not gonna be easy. Um, it's not just gonna be a walk in the park. I mean, nothing in life worth having is gonna be completely easy, but just, you know, putting in the legwork, and you'll find that starting with a conversation and building into something great, creating an organization like they have, the Liberian organization, just, you know, just making those steps every day. And, you know, it's not gonna be perfect, but just as long as you keep the vision and persevere, you can definitely make it happen. And you said something about the women. Us, so women having self-respect? Yes, because a nation cannot rise above its women. Say that one more time. A nation cannot rise above its women. Um, that's true. That's true. I, I believe that 100%. Um, as far as empowering women, um, I think it starts with self. It starts with self. Uh, you have to know that you're not going to continue to settle for what you're dealing with. You have to develop that standard for yourself um, and understand that, you know, what's going on, like, okay, this doesn't make me feel right. It comes down to your gut feeling. This doesn't feel right. I don't like the way that this is going, so I'm going to say no. Like, just start with saying no. Rosa Parks started with saying no. Like, just say no to the things that you don't like. And um, once you start to develop that sense of self, I think you're really able to connect with like-minded people, putting yourself in different environments, putting yourself in different spaces where other women are empowered. They took the step to say no. And um, again, once you have those groups, those communities that are coming together, like a small match can light a huge fire. Um, so it starts with you saying no, connecting with other people, and it can really grow to a big initiative. But it definitely starts with that person um, specifically. I want to also add that <clears throat> by saying that uh, I totally agree, it starts with itself. And then coupled with the uh, start with self, going on to vision, commitment, dedication, devotion, all those things add up to make the self, to solidify the self. If you make your mind, for example, the great city of Winston Salem today where we are. It took few Moravians to create a city. They walk, they had the vision for it, they prayed about it, they had a vision, and they were in Philadelphia. They walk from Philadelphia and set and uh, and, and set the oil and set the uh, what was the place in the uh uh Batabra. And they 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 they, they created a settlement of Batabra. From Batabra, we have Winston, we have Salem. I mean, from Batabra, of course, Salem. Then the uh, uh, Winston, Salem, uh, then Winston. Then, of course, in 1913, actually May 13, 1913, the two city combined became Winston Salem. And incidentally, May 13, 1913 is the birthday of our late president, Torah, that I spoke about first. He was born the same day that Winston and Salem. Wow. From the apartment here. The same day, same year. But it started with those 
people, those people, brave Moravians, they had a vision to walk from that place, establish uh, the tavern, then the two cities came about, then all these things what started to happen. So it started with that set, and you gotta have that vision. You gotta be committed, you gotta be dedicated, and know what you wanna do, and what you was it. No. So that, that, that's what we are. But the problem we have there is that, again, going back to the slavery, that was one component that was denying us, when I say us, meaning our ancestors, they didn't have the way to have that kind of vision. Because why? The, the, uh, the slave master used what you call divide and conquer, as someone said earlier. We were made not to trust each other. And that was the only way they would conquer us and subdue us. Okay? They made you not to believe me because uh, they, 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 they took you, for instance, make you the, uh, the host master, the host mistress, rather. You in charge, you take it out, you big and bad because you hang with them. You know? So the, uh, the slave, the free slave, where some class to the host, the host maid or the host master, where it was. So, because you're able to do that, to use that uh, 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 strategy, we begin to what? Talk against ourselves. We put each other. And actually, that was to their benefit because it protected them. Okay? They know you can. You can uh, talk to your people in the in the in the, uh, in the feed, and you close to them. You find a way that uh, uh, you have your own insider up in the feed that you make that person to feel important because if they see you talk to Mary, uh, 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 Mary and Mary is on the feed, your know, feed slate. You know, people see you talking. They kind of think Mary is big and bad, you know, she's, she's all it because she knows you and you know the master. But actually what the, what the master is doing is to use you to intercept whatever it is that is going on in the field and you report it. So it was a strategy and that strategy what is embedded in us today that we don't even trust each other no more. And it started from then. I'm just sorry, at the same time where they're embedding this in you, they're also embedding in their children that they're better than us. So yeah. you still have this going on, this parallel. So it's no way to me where you can sort of escape. But I think what we need to look at is next year will mark the 60th year of the um, sit-in movement. 60 short years ago, Black people could not be served at a Woolworth lunch counter. Six, if we think about slavery ending in 1865, but we don't think about how we were freed, then Reconstruction, of course, then Jim Crow, then the Civil Rights Movement. So we've had to overcome so many obstacles. We're always in a fight. Uh, it's sort of hard to stop and look at some opportunities because you're, you're trying to, to make a life better. But, um, so, and there has been a systematic racism. We have, everything has been put on black people uh, systemically. Um, and so we've got to break that system. And in order to break that system, white people got to give up, they gotta let go of some of the power. So I don't know how long that's gonna take or, or when it's gonna happen, but we're still gonna always to me be in a fight because if you got the power, just like those free American blacks that went to Liberia and then they go and oppress the indigenous people. Yeah. Um, power is something that people don't want to give up. So we just to answer your question to me, we've just been in a struggle. It, and it's only been 60 years ago or so, and it hadn't been 155 years um, when slavery ended. And we should be a lot further 
But why aren't we a lot further? Because the people who are in power have decided that that's not going to happen. I think women, I think women have come a long way. And I think if you if you continue to set that standard that you have set from back in the day and continue to add on it, it would work. Uh, we remember, we know it very well that the 13th Amendment freed the slaves so women became free. 14th Amendment gave black, what, citizenship, right? 15th Amendment gave us the right to vote. Men! There was no woman at that time. You are, you are over here, but you are denied rest. 50 years later, 19, what, 1920, right? The 19th Amendment, right? You all fought for that right. And you all got it. And it, it looks like you have not stopped since then. So when you're talking about women, continue to mobilize them, continue to galvanize them, continue to put up a fight and set that standard. That the higher you set the standard, it'll be difficult for people to run over you. So continue to do what do it. I love Um, the black family. Can y'all please talk about the black family in America and how it's important for them to like be together as a white man and woman because there's a lot of single moms out here and it's a lot of like um even in Hollywood on movies how you see the the bad you know, dad be dead and the black men are, you know, not there for the children and that separates and I feel like yes it starts with self but it also really starts with who raises you. So it's like if the mom and dad are not together, not intertwined and they raise these kids separately. They're not getting the full, my mom, my dad. They're just getting the majority of my dad, the majority of my mom, and they're missing the other half of them, let alone already missing their black history. Well, what I would say, like, you know, like I forgot the lady name, sure. which is okay. Cheryl. Yeah. Yeah. Cheryl. It's based, <laughs> it's based on, specifically, um, from the day the United States became colonized, right? The women never had full rights. So as the year has went on, America, the American society have kept that systematic idea of segregation and they have passed it on to minorities, which are African Americans and any other minority groups. So they understand that women, like the man in the family, has a very strong ties to keeping that family together. His job is to always provide and be the backbone. And the women provides that nurture, fulfilling in that maternal instincts, right? When you take the man out of the home, we leave the woman, she's, she, her mind, how do I put it? Um, well, I can put it from my experience, right? I grew up in a single home, grew up with a single mother. My family came here, we were all together, right? My mom and dad was married, and I had brothers. We all came here as one family. Over the years, they separated, right? My dad went his way, my mother went her way. But from my experience, I, could, I know for a fact the joy of feeling that having my father with me as a, as a family, it was different when they separated because it was easier for society to easily say, okay, you're a black man in America. This is what it's gonna be like for you, right? You get in trouble, you get in prison, or you're incarcerated. And from school, if I get in trouble, I remember when I used to get in trouble in school where there was always reports that was being written up. And first is they're white kids, right? They get in the same type of trouble I get in, but they receive less punishment than I do, a lesser retaliation for their actions. And this this just boils down to the systematic the system that is in place in the United States. That's all it is. That without the system being broken up. It's always going to be the male needs to be attract, extracted from their family because the man holds that backbone to his family. So until that is abolished, or we as minority seems to realize that and know that it is important for us to be a family, no matter how hard the struggle is to be a family. As long as we understand that and stay together, we can prosper because we make up for what 90, what 90 to 98 percent of the world economic system. So, as a whole, we're always strong. We always make a big change in America, in the world, in general. Okay, 
I think what James said, James alluded to the whole thing now when he said they divide and conquer mechanism, divide the people so that we cannot be united. And I think the reason they do not want us to unite because they are firm. Because when you unite, the force, the power, is greater. So once, like his reference said, once you keep them apart, they will all be that far. Put the guy in jail. And you know, got more black folks in jail. Put him in jail, and take him away from the home. And then you send him to war, you know, just all kinds of things just to keep us apart. And for some reason, it looks like we are not getting it. We are not getting it. That it is affecting us, it has affected us before, it is still affecting us today in the 21st century. We still have that problem. When are we going to understand that whatever the stuff they used back then is still working on us? Divide and come. We are divided. And the same thing happened when they went to Africa. When when the when the when the European went to Africa, the scramble for Africa, you know, divide a continent without one African being present and say, you take this, you take this, you take this, you take this, you know. That's not happening. And it is here. And you guys know that if the black can ever get together, woohoo! <laughs> the world will change. And it is time for us to start doing um, do we have any other closing remarks? Because we're uh, going a little bit over time. I just want to thank uh, Darrell. I haven't had the opportunity to do that. Thank you. We thank um, for more conversations like this. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Darrell. Any other closing remarks? Thank you, everybody, thank you. for just inviting me to be part of this uh, history making uh, forum. And I'm happy and glad I could be a part of it. Thank you, everybody. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, quickly, I just want to say again, thanks to the organizer, Mr. Slade. Thank you so much for the vision. Again, like I said, take a vision. Mm -hmm. You leading this, OK? You embrace other people to come to it. And here we are today with, you know, we didn't have a full house, but you know what? How do I have be full? Mm -hmm. The people that were here did not have the challenge to pass it on. Hey man, you missed a program. Okay? They talk about this, 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 and that. And next time, don't stop yet. Next time, move forward to with that, with that, you know, keep the vision, yes, keep sir. the commitment, keep that dedication. Yes, sir. And you'll be surprised what will come out of this. Yes, I want to thank you for your vision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Honder. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Thank you, Bluffy.